Hey everybody, Chris Brown here with uh, another video for Shockwave. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Yusuf Ahmad, uh, CTO and complex PCI operator at UCSF. Yusuf, thanks for joining me, man. Thanks for having me, Chris. I got this right coronary CTO I wanted to show you. I wanted to sort of pick your brain about how you would do it. I'll show you what we ended up doing and kind of see what you think about this. I always have a hard time deciding how to modify this calcium, you know, when we get across, that obviously assumes that we're going to get across, but we have this pretty calcified right coronary CTO, kind of can't see the outflow that well, but it's kind of hazy down here. It almost looks like you might be having some sort of competitive flow or like some sort of micro channel. I was able to just put my, I think it's probably a Shion black. It actually got pretty far, you know, I'm pretty close to the cap at a minimum and there might be a way for me to keep going, frankly. Um, but you know, I uh, took my micro catheter, gave myself some support, put a safety wire next to myself and was able to escalate to, I think a Gladius Mongo or a Pilot 200, I forget which one, and then was able to select the, what's probably an intraplaque course, which always gives me pause because I think to myself, well, if I would have gone around all this stuff, I kind of kind of pushed it out of my way. I would have got an eccentric looking stent, but you know, I wouldn't have had to figure out how to, how to modify this. But I don't know for sure that I'm in extra plaque or intraplaque yet. Um, but I think based on the way that the wire crossed and everything, I'm probably in triplax. So now I'm kind of in a, in a position of like, well, what do I do? You know, I, what do you do here? So distally, it looks like you're in. Yeah, but you're, for sure. You're completely right is that we, you know, we don't know when we've crossed intraplaque or extra plaque. And there's good, you know, either data that shows that if you ask the operators, you know, they can be wrong in any configuration. You can think mm -hmm. you crossed through to true and you were, you were out. You can think that you went out and you were true the whole way through. So we don't, won't, You'll get one, the first clue you'll get is as to how the microcatheter is going to behave when you're trying to drill it through. And then the, yeah. definitively, you're going to find out um, once you do the imaging. But, yeah. you know, based on this picture, it looks, you know, I suspect that if it is extra plaque, it's a very, very short portion of being extra plaque. You haven't done dedicated ADR, so I don't think it's going to be like a long subinterval portion. So I would see if you're able to get the microcatheter down. And then I would make a quick fire decision on, depending on how hard it is to get the microcatheter down. If it's difficult, I'm going to immediately drop an atherectomy wire because I've had issues where I've been burned before trying to do pragmatic pre dill And then later in the case, when I want to go back to atherectomy, it's a nightmare to get the microcatheter back down. So I think if you get it down, if it was hard to get there, just put a, an atherectomy wire into atherectomy. If it flies down, then I might put a wiggle down and try and pre-dilate. But it's going to take a lot of work before you can get lithotripsy in, I think, with this degree of um, tortuosity. And so maybe pre-dilatation, get the guide extension down, and then lithotripsy versus yeah. atherectomy, and then going to lithotripsy after. Well, I can tell you it was horrendous getting this microcatheter in. I actually went through two or no, maybe three separate brands of microcatheter trying to get across this. So then in my mind, I was certain that we were doing atherectomy, whether I was intraplaque yep. or extraplaque in any place because I was going nowhere. So I think I started with a Mamba Flex. Um, I think I went to, I might have gone to a course, a regular Corsair Pro thinking, well, maybe the, the soft tip will get through like whatever piece of calcium. I can't seem to get the little beak of the Mamba Flex through, even though it's got a really low entry profile, it's pretty short. And then ultimately I had to take a turnpike spiral and just use the calcium as sort of a, a like a piece of wood and just sort of grab onto the calcium with those spirals. And then I was for sure not doing anything but straight rotowire, as you said, because we're I was never getting back down there. I'm, and I'm terrible at, I don't know about you, but I never floro store or remember to, I barely remembered even Sene that we did rota. Yeah. yeah. Uh, none let it's alone. Like it's just leaving the guy because you remember for that one split second. Yeah, exactly. So, and that might, honestly, I'll be frank, that could have been on the way out. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, oh, we forgot to tell anybody that we did this. Um, but here's the flow after a pretty good, pretty big channel, really. I mean, the, and the interesting thing is, is the rotoblader didn't get hugely hung up. I will say that I bird this pretty high speed. I think I started at 185, and when I got down toward that final corner where the microcatheter hung up, I just had them uh, turn it to 200 for me. So I wasn't gonna, I didn't want to get it stuck and trapped or deal with any of that nonsense. I don't know what speed you like to burr at, but I bird a pretty high speed to try and not get this thing stuck if I can. Yeah, I, I start my runs at 180, and then if I haven't crossed the lesion on the fourth or fifth run, then I go up to 200, and then then if assuming this was a 1.5 bear, yep. you know, if I haven't crossed the 200 after like you know eight 
to 10 passes, I'll either go to 220 or I'll exchange out for a 125. Yeah. I think that's a good point too. I mean, you only have so many minutes on the burr um, before it really needs to be swapped out because you lose the diamond coating too. So it's like, you know, if you're doing 10 or 15 second runs or and if you're doing longer runs, you know, if you do eight cycles or something, your burr might be wore out. I don't do longer runs really anymore just because I don't want to deal with the no reflow part. Um, but I don't do as much pecking as I once did either. I kind of let the burr actually drill through calcium. Um, I don't know what you think about that or how you do it now. Yeah. But. Um, with, I just think, I think pecking is, a, it's the way I think I was originally taught to do it, but it's kind of a weird term. There's not really a, a corollary to any other thing we do in the cath lab. And I feel like it means different things to different people. And my worry with pecking, and particularly you know, with teaching fellows, you tell them to peck and you see people do it differently. You can really get people jab and like lean on it. And then that's the worry is that you're going to exert too much forward pressure. Mm -hmm. Either squirt through and not come back or exit. So I try and kind of grind through it. Um, and I do very, very short runs as well. So I do 10 to 15 seconds and then stop. Yeah, I'm with you. I like to put just enough forward pressure to actually be engaging the calcium, but not so much to get it trapped, but you know, essentially just working through actually drilling through calcium. You would never take a drill bit at your house and try and drill through a piece of wood by like tapping into it with the <laughs> drill. You would gently put it into the wood and as it did its thing, it would you know, do its job and it would extrude the wood for you and you'd get a good result. We were able to deliver lithotripsy actually with just the use of a guide extension. We didn't really do anything special. I mean, you saw that, you, you know, you could see the floral store of it. The balloon expands pretty nicely here, um, even after just starting to pulse, honestly. I mean, there's a little bit of a waste, but we get pretty good expansion. There's a lot more calces where I got stuck. So, you know, yeah. this is going to be the not pleasant part. And, um, and it gets bigger and bigger, as you can kind of imagine. We got a bubble in here. We should have reprepped this balloon. I think I, there we go. We reprepped the balloon, and I resented it because I didn't like the the bubble that was in it because it wasn't doing anything for me. The expansion looks good though, even in the gnarly kind of mid part where the bends and where the microcaster was getting stuck. The expansion looks good. Exactly. So, trying to get to the ostium, you know, aggressive guide, trying to get to the ostium. Ibis does not want to go for a minute, but I just gave it a little guide extension love and then the Ibis was on its way. Um, we used the Boston Ibis, I don't know what you use, mostly we use the six French one. The five French one's kind of flimsy and hard to deliver. And it, I don't like flushing the Ibis in the coronaries because you know it introduces air and you can get no reflow from it. And so I try and use the six French one because you can flush it a little better and you get less image distortion and dropouts. It's definitely, yeah, we're in the process of, we have both still, but I think me and the majority of my colleagues are switching over to default six French. Yeah. It's way quicker to prep. You don't have to flush in the coronary as much, and it's way more kink resistant. You know, I find that if I, if I do, if I'm doing anything moderately difficult with the five French, and I'm doing it even slightly in a hurry, which I often am. A I'll kink, and a hint, and a, yep, I mean, yeah, you, essentially, I've broken about a bajillion of them that yeah. exact <laughs> same way. A little stent boost here, just or stent viz, or I don't know, whatever brand name they call this thing. Still pretty good expansion here. I mean, yeah. these stents look pretty decent. You know, this is just me trying to figure out how much more stent I need. What am I doing here? Well, we're floral storing something, I guess, probably the Ibis. Let's see what else. We got to do a little post still with a large non compliant balloon that's super long. And here's our final result. Pretty mm -hmm. happy. We took a left-sided picture to make sure our guy didn't do anything. Took it out. Took yeah, this picture. The arches are there. That looks yeah. great. So I guess the question is, you know, there's that rotoshock data. I think, um, I think, realistically speaking, there's just a lot of times we still need atherectomy, and I think in nodules. Um, there's probably going to be, and there is some data, but there'll be increasingly, I think, more data that if you can shave some of the nodule away on a lot of the ones that are not just like the eruptive kind, but like the kind that are really deep icebergs, that you um, are able to penetrate deeper with whatever lithotripsy you actually have, um, and you probably get better plaque modification that way. I think that I think that's my anticipation based on the data that I've seen so far. I don't know what you think about roto, rototripsy or rotoshock or however you want to put it, but um, yeah. That's kind of where I'm at. I, you know, I, I used to say I only using it to deliver, meaning I need to be use it to be able to deliver the lithotripsy, and that still holds true in circumferential calcium for sure, and in general. But I do think getting rid of some of the calcium, if you can, can improve things um, 
with regard to uh, how deep you can penetrate when you have this, these big nodules and this really deep calcium to modify. Yeah, I feel like nodular calcium is, you know, every modality has had like a few months where people said this is the best thing to do for nodules. You know, yeah. so while it was just IVL, for a while it was orbital. Yeah. And when people say road to blade, but do it at really slow speed so that it was more like orbital and you got more contact or getting that wobble, or, yeah. Yeah, or try and figure out what the wire bias is and then switch your, you know, rotor wire out to get the right wire bias. Um, it, I think that just speaks to the fact that we don't have a very good treatment for it. So we're cycling through everything and then I don't agree. really know what the optimal is. But I feel like you need to throw the kitchen sink at them. Whatever we do, they tend to come back. And so I also do a lot of this combination therapy where I start with atherectomy which I think plausibly does modify, you know, the surface of the nodule like you described, and then something that can get to the, potentially to the, further to the base of the nodule like lithotripsy, and then allow you to get the best possible MSA. And then I do use the thicker strut radial, high radial force strengths for nodules. Again, there's no good data for that. I do it kind of on biological plausibility. And just feel like sometimes you need as strong, you know, metallic scaffold as possible to kind of keep the nodule at bay. I'm a full believer in that. We had several people that I treated where I thought I got a great result and put in a thin strutted stent and it went terrible because they came back, you know, six, eight, ten months later with that nodule denting back into my stent essentially. And we went back in and hit it with an NC and it would go out of the way pretty easily, honestly. We didn't even have to do lithotripsy again. Um, and so we put in a second stent that time thick strut and we've been using thick strut ever since and we've just had a lot better results with people not having to come back and that in the anecdotes that I'm mentioning there's two of them I can think of in particular they came back for something else at a different time for a left coronary intervention that was like needed and both of them still had a patent uh, second stent if you want to call it that so I'm a full believer in whatever thick strut stent you want to use to push the nodule out of the way you should go for it because i think we maybe you know we wanted it to be thinner and thinner and thinner so we didn't get isr but when you're talking about how calcified vessels have gotten i think you got to have some radial strength for sure yeah i agree i've actually had cases that come back even sooner than that sort of six month time point where really good optimal you know lesion prepped on an index procedure ivis optimized result of the index procedure looks good and then within like six to eight weeks, patients are coming back with recurrent angina and the nodule is just like crushed through the stent that's there. And I've actually had the same experience as you is that the, when you dilate them, they dilate very easily. I tended to re-IVL them just again for wanting a feeling of, you know, having left nothing, you know, in the sure. back yeah. kitchen sink. Um, but they redilate very easily, and then I've re-stented now maybe half a dozen of these with, you know, thick strut, high radial force then and they have not come back yet you know as i said not sure. systematic not you know high quality data but i'm with you that you know on, on the premise of biological plausibility and anecdote i've switched over to doing that for, for nodules awesome man well thanks for running through this with me i really appreciate it thank you for having me great case for sure have a good night